Good morning, Real Estate Mindset community, and welcome to another morning live and happy Monday. Now, as far as what's going to happen later on in this week, unfortunately, guys, I'm probably only going to be able to do about maybe three lives this week. The reason I'm only going to be able to do maybe more, but about three lives this week is I'm devoting so much time, so much energy, so much attention into our first free home buying course. Okay. Actually, before I went live, I just filmed right before hitting live right now, I just filmed six lessons. So hopefully tonight I will be done with our first module of the home buying class. Now I'm going to release the first module of our home buying class to our members of the channel. Now, eventually when I'm done with it, I'm going to release it to the public. But for now, as far as a beta and test, I'm going to be releasing that again, hopefully tonight, the first part of it, I'm going to be releasing hopefully tonight to my channel members. And I really hope you guys can give me some feedback because again, my main goal of, you know, the home buying class is to empower you. And honestly, guys, because of the way I want to live my life, the home buying class is just as much for me as it is for you. I want to feel, you know, I want to be a good person. I want to feel like, and know that I'm giving you guys overwhelming value. So regardless, we're going to jump in, but let me, uh, I threw up this question. I thought it was really good uh, because there's a lot of talk about assumable mortgages. And I want to let you guys know that assumable mortgages are legit. Generally, assumable mortgages only come on like FHA, VA, and USDA loans. But also understand, even though an assumable mortgage is great, basically you get the terms of the old loan, understand you also have to qualify for an assumable mortgage. So it's not just a slam dunk. You got to go through that entire process and it can take up to three months to do. That's why those subject to deals that you guys hear a lot about are so popular because the subject to goes around the lender uh, and basically doesn't tell them anything. And I see some of you guys, I see Johnny sacred. I see all you guys don't move, see all you guys. But um, anyways, let's jump right into our market update. And where I want to start you guys uh, at is let's talk about the market volatility. Okay. So looking at the VIX, so here's the VIX right here. And <laughs> Here's the thing, you guys, I, I don't think I did a, a Friday live. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I've just been so overwhelmed with this home buying course. It's so on my heart to do this uh, and because I know I'm going to be judged on my performance as an influencer by how much value I'm giving back to my community. At least that's what I think. So anyways, here's the VIX, you guys. It went up on Friday. We ended Friday double digit increase. I think it ended up on Friday up 15%. So even though it's down 5% right now, the VIX it's still shooting up. And what this is, is an indication that the market is starting to wake up to the fact that we're probably going to enter a recession, a hard landing, job loss, bankruptcies, blah, 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 blah. But the VIX has been absolutely surging. Now I've heard, and again, I'm not in stocks. Good morning, Dooster. I see you, brother. No, I'm not in stocks, but I've been told that essentially every time we've entered recession, the VIX has hit $40. So that's why I've been really watching VIX. If it goes to $40 before every recession, it kind of looks like it's a good buy. Now, I've been talking to you guys about VIX when it was at $13. Uh, I think it was like $13 and change. But anyways, guys, it's sitting at $18 right now, even though it's down 6%, that is up. Now, take a look at the dollar. This is the Dixie. So when you guys hear about the Dixie, the DXY, this is, import this is an important gauge to see basically, you know, for lack of better words, weaponizing the dollar. I mean, it's kind of an indication of, right, weaponizing the dollar. The higher this is, the more that the dollar is crushing the world. So this is the dollar comparing to other currencies, right? Outside of the US, it's not in the US, it's outside of the US. So the higher that this goes, the more economic and financial turmoil more than likely is gonna be spread out through the world. So that's been going up, it's pretty much flat today, but keep you guys' eye on the Dixie. Take a look at oil. Okay, I know we don't cover oil a lot, but obviously I'm covering oil because oil adds to the inflation. If we have to, if we're in a situation to where we continuously have inflation, we're going to have higher rates for longer and that impacts the housing market. So oil is important. Oil does have an impact somewhat on the housing market, right? It does have an impact on inflation. But anyways, guys, I want you guys to do me a favor. Comment below. Let me know if you think we're going to hit $100, $100 a barrel. A lot of people are saying $100 a barrel. I'm not 100% sure if we're going to hit $100 a barrel, but comment below. Are we going to hit $100 a barrel this year? We're at 87.11 right now. Let's move on to the next thing, which is gold. What? I never cover gold, even though I have gold. Now, here's the thing. Okay, so I invested in gold. I got like my rest of my liquidity in T-bills. I got about 10% in gold. I didn't make money on gold. 
All right, I'm making money on T-bills. I ain't making money on gold. I bought gold in the 1900s, okay? I'll admit it, all right? I don't make money on gold. Like no one makes real money on gold. The purpose of the gold and the reason why I'm investing in the gold, guys, is if crap hits the fan. It's like a hedge against like everything falls apart. So that's why I have 10% gold and I can actually relatively easily like trade my gold in to a local dealer for you know, almost market value, not market value. But anyways, guys, gold is at 1928. This was in the 1800s last week. So this got down to the, in the 1800s last week. Let's move on to the next thing, which is the economy killer or business destroyer, also known as the 10 year treasury. Okay. So also known as the 10 year treasury. I totally forgot to timestamp the market update. Anyways, here's the 10 year treasury. This is the long end of the yield. So the long end, okay. We're not talking short end. We're talking a long end. The fact that the 10 year, <laughs> this is so crazy. It's up almost 10 basis points. Now here's the thing last week. Okay. As a primary result of the Israel war, there basically was a flight of safety to the long end of the yield. Okay. And, and then when I mean a flight of safety, people started buying the 10 year and that's why the rates uh, started going down because when people buy the rates go down. So it actually lost a lot of momentum last week, but look at guys, look at just the pressure, the pressure on the 10 year to go up is remarkable. In fact, it's actually the, one of the first time in histories that we've had disinversion. It's not uh, uninverted yet, but the yields have been disinverted by the long end. Normally it's the short end, you know, because the federal funds rate is dropped. But again, you guys, this is what's killing the economy because this is so high banks and companies can't make enough money, can't make as much money. And the longer that this stays elevated, the more uncertainty will happen. And again, the, also the more lending restrictions. Okay. So more lending restrictions, credit tightening, the more that this stays elevated. Again, this is the long end of the yield. So let's look at the short end. Here's the short end, okay? We also call this, and I like to call this, the liquidity zapper, okay? So long end, destroying businesses, destroying the economy, short end of the yield, quantitative tightening. So basically, people are buying the one month, and then the government burns the money, okay? So people buy this, government takes the money, and they burn the money. It's quantitative tightening, part of quantitative tightening. So the one month right now, this is what I have almost all of my, 90% of my liquidity. 90% of my liquidity is in one month T-bells, and I am yielding over 5.3%. The, the, where I go to do that is Treasury Direct. So I go to Treasury Direct to do that. And again, you guys, I buy blocks uh, every week. So every week I have new maturing one month treasuries. And I have, I think, six blocks total. So every week I'm getting payments every single week. And you guys may want to do the same thing, especially if you're not doing anything with your liquidity. So take advantage of the inflation when we can, right? Now that interest rates are so high, let's make money off of that to help offset how expensive things are. But anyways, guys, this is important. The short end is just as important as the long end, because remember, we want liquidity to be removed from the economy because that's going to bring back balance. And in essence, guys, the Federal Reserve printed way too much money. They printed way too much money and it's still in the economy. So the one month is good. One month sitting at 5.43. We need this rate higher than this rate. Okay. This is the one day, let's just say one day treasury. This is the reverse repo market. So the reverse repo market is yielding 5.3%. So basically guys, as long as the one month you see here is over the one day or the reverse repo market rate of 5.3, we will continue to see the money melt down out of the reverse repo market. Now, there's many people that believe as soon as the money is gone from the reverse repo market, that things are really going to start hitting the fan. Okay. So I just wanted to, you guys, you know, to know the trajectory. So since about the beginning of July, it's been plummeting downward. There was a you know, little bit of an increase here, but look at this, guys. So this is great because we have too much money in the economy, not in my bank account. I wish there was too much money in my bank account. I wish there was too much money in your bank account. But quite frankly, you guys, there's too much money in the economy. If you want to understand the liquidity, where the money is at, keep your eyes on the reverse, uh, overnight reverse repo market. But again, you guys, the trajectory is still going down. Now, let's take a look at the inversion of the yields. Okay, this is one of the strongest economic indicators. And we let me put the one year so you guys can see this. Look at this, guys. So it was re-inverting. Look at that. Just just unbelievably skyrocketing upward. 
So we're like, oh my God, we're going to enter the recession. It's going to be in six months, the recession. And then look it, it went down. So this started, this started inverting again. And the reason this started inverting again, remember, so the Fed has all these plans, but anytime a black swan event happens, it, it puts a wrench in the plans. And the wrench in the plans of the Fed this time around was the war in Israel. So because there was movements and that tenure went down, the inversion obviously um, got steeper. So remember when this uninverts, usually we enter a recession within six months, except in the inflationary battle in the 70s and 80s, in the 70s and 80s, we actually stayed inverted and entered a recession. But keep your eyes on this. Uh, we flipped trajectory, but it was just really astonishing just seeing that trajectory, just really literally every single day making progress on the reinversion. We're not there yet. Now, let's take a look at mortgage interest rates. Now, you guys should know by now that the 10-year or the long end of the yields has a massive impact on the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Because remember this, you guys, lenders lend on the short, right? And they, I'm sorry, they, they borrow on the short, lend on long. Okay. So they borrow short, lend long. Okay. So currently right now, interest rate 7.66%. I mean, holy smokes. It, it's that's okay. So even though the war in Israel dropped the 10 year and, and it actually had a, a massive drop, 7.66 is higher. And also guys, remember this right here, let me see, where's the 10 year. That's a one month. This right here, this increase of 10 basis points, well, it's nine basis points right now, is not yet showing in the mortgage rates. So usually this updates in the afternoon and following the tenure allows us the opportunity to see the trajectory. Now, if I was out shopping for a mortgage right now and purchasing a house, I would lock my rate. I would lock my rate right now because more than likely rates are just going to continue to go up depending on what happens in Israel, right? But anyways, guys, let's do a workup of how expensive a 7.66% is and how it works on the amortization schedule. Now, by now, you guys should be getting used to the amortization schedule. This is something that I use to explain to you guys how awful mortgage date is. An amortization schedule, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but it should be against the law because it's front loaded with interest. So understand that if you buy a house, right? And you were told, you know, marry the house date, the rate, and you refinance, you wasted probably 30, 40, $50,000 in interest. And you have to start the loan over again. So this whole premise, like it's horrible to rent. It's, th this is a rare occasion that I believe this is a rare occasion where rent makes a lot of sense because your true interest rate is not 7.66. Your true interest rate is 150% unless you refinance. If you refinance, understand, it's just, it's like shooting yourself in the foot. But let's go over this again. So the total amount of interest you guys would pay over 30 years, if you took today's average interest rate of 7.66% with today's average loan amount of 328,000, total amount, you guys, in interest, okay? Total amount of interest, 510,000. $510,000 in interest, that's insane. Now. I also like to remind you guys that, you know, putting money after you close into your amortization schedule is a great thing. Now, remember last week, I don't know if Comic Lever's on here, but Comic Lever is like, no, your down payment is, is, is better. Your down payment is better. But what we found is it's just as good. So sometimes people don't have a down payment and say they save their money and a year later they have, say, they're able to save $15,000. You guys need to understand that you can pay the amortization schedule down at any point. You only have one opportunity to put a down payment down, but you have many opportunities to pay your amortization schedule down. So I like to show you guys what $20,000 does, or rather, how do we get the amortization schedule to 25 years? So how do we pay the loan down five years? Okay, so right now, what I want you guys to understand, in order to pay this amortization schedule down to 25 years, okay, it's instead of $20,000, because we started at $20,000, and now it takes only... $17,169. So if you guys got $17,000, you call your lender up, you say, hey, I want to put $17,000 on the principal. You guys save five years. But not only do you save five years, remember, you save all of these interest payments right here. See all of these? Yes, BRN. Thank God. Finally, finally, someone saw Ron Swanson. Thank you. Yes, that is Ron Swanson. I'm, I'm so flattered that you finally, someone finally mentioned that. But anyways, guys, if you do that, that $17,000 will also save you the first five years of interest, which is going to be a total of $122,000. So again, you pay $17,000 down on your amortization schedule. You save over $120,000 
over the course of the loan. So pay attention, please, to what I'm saying. And again, if you don't have a down payment right away, boom, pay it towards your amortization schedule. Now, let's talk about how much the average person qualifies for and how much they lose in purchasing power by having debt. So you guys know this is what we've been doing, $100,000 uh, for a salary. So we're taking a household that's making a hundred thousand dollars. I'm using today's interest rate of 7.66%. But what I want you guys to pay attention to is the monthly credit card and consumer debt payments. So we're saying that this couple or household has $1,400 in consumer debt payments, which is a lot. Now, remember, if you guys want to come here, this is linked in almost every single one of my videos, drop the debt to income ratio down to 45%. Okay. Now what this represents is if you make a hundred thousand dollars, the household makes a hundred thousand dollars, the average person, average household qualifies for only $294,000. Again, a $100,000 household. But what I want to show you also is look at the power of consumer debt. The power of consumer debt when it pertains to purchasing power, I, I can't explain this enough. So when I reduce and I show that this person has no consumer debt, so let me remove that, okay? And I recalculate this, look at what they qualify for now. Okay. Now the difference of having debt versus no debt is a total amount of $178,000 or rather you guys understand what I'm saying. Okay. Listen to what I'm saying. Cause I just did the math. So the av so that equals 60%. Okay. So the average person loses, listen, the average person loses 60% in purchasing power by having consumer debt. So if you worried about, oh, how do I qualify for a bigger house? How do I qualify for a home I love? And you have consumer debt. Well, a good place to start if you want to qualify for more is having no consumer debt. In fact, I don't think people should even go look at houses until they have a handle on the consumer debt. And you guys, it is incredibly, incredibly harmful. But anyways, we're going to go into our first video. Um, this one is a very interesting. So we're going to go into our first video. Let me throw up my timestamp. I think I'm making some good time. I'm not sure. I think I am. First video is from the former FHA commissioner. He's going to go into how rich Americans are okay. Cool. Rich Americans are okay. What? what, what? I think, is he talking to the 1% or is he talking to the rest of us? So he's going to go into that. Uh, and, he, and really what I like that he's going to go into is the fact that they overcorrected during COVID. Basically, we're in this problem because the government overcorrected and we're paying for it. We're paying for our government's overcorrection. Anyways, guys, I hope you like this video. If you can, please shoot me a comment and let me know that the audio is okay. For more, let's bring in former FHA Commissioner David Stevens. David, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Hi, Kelly. Great to be with you. You've got a, a proposal here that I think is going to be the first of many that we hear about how to lower mortgage rates. What would yours do exactly? Well, look, first of all, it started off as a proposal from people like me. In the last couple of days, we've seen a joint trade letter from the Mortgage Bankers Association, the National Association of Home Builders, the National Association of Realtors. And then today, the Independent Community Bankers Association joined in with the community home lenders. It seems like everybody's talking about the same concern, which is this. Uh, what created the hyperinflation were three basic items, right? One was the CARES Act passed in March of 2020, which brought a, a, you know almost $2 trillion of stimulus into the economy. The second was the Federal Reserve coming in with the largest round of quantitative easing ever in American history, uh, which drove interest rates down to the low 2% range for mortgages at its, at its lowest. And then obviously the third were supply chain issues. But this hyperinflation is, is the result of an unexpected kind of overcorrection to the COVID pandemic, which just brought too much stimulus into the economy. And now we're all paying the price with the Federal Reserve completely changing gears, creating a vacuum where they once were the largest buyer of mortgage-backed securities to not buying any. And that has resulted in a supply and demand imbalance, and that's what's driven rates up to nearly 8% today. Um, and what's unique about today's market is that the spread between mortgages and the 10-year treasury, which is what we normally look at to shadow and, and view where mortgage rates should be, is, is much wider than it traditionally is. It's about 100 basis points wide. So the proposal is simple. Um, the MBA home builder letter says, 
that the Fed should at minimum state that it's done with quantitative tightening um, and uh, that it should make it clear that it's over and not just uh, that they're going to keep looking forward at, at new economic changes. Right. Um, the, the second proposal suggests that it, that we should do something further, that in past economic cycles, we've seen either the GSEs, Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae, when they could put loans on their portfolio before conservatorship, they would buy up excess supply during times like this uh, or the Fed. But just pick up the slack, not go back to quantitative easing. Well, let me just jump in for up, let me just jump yeah. in for a second. So, you know, whether or not the Fed can do more is a question that relates back to the economy and also to whether people are going to now blame them for partly causing this problem in the first place by buying so much. Right. Uh, so that leaves Fannie and Freddie. And wouldn't we have to change their structure? I mean, they're in conservatorship still. So this raises the question yeah. about taking them out of it in order to be able to buy up MBS. And now having these discussions, I feel like I'm back in 2006 all over again. <laughs> well, it is it is complicated. First of all, the excess is only about $2 billion a day, which sounds like a lot to an average listener. But you know, think that the Fed bought about $1.7 trillion between 2020 and 2022, $2 billion a day for maybe 30 or 40 days to take out the excess capacity would be incredibly impactful to rates in the short run. Not Never bringing them back to where they were, but certainly bringing them back to about 100 basis points lower than they are today. Dave, let me, ask a, let me ask a yeah. silly question as well, because I know do yeah. we need, I mean, how many people are buying a home right now compared with the past? That number feels like it's, is this really a crisis? Well, it's really a crisis because we've also had a shortage of supply, which drove home prices up. And we have one of the largest demographic waves of millennials all coming into their early 30s yeah. that the nation has ever seen. So the supply and demand problem is critical. And it's not affecting wealthy Americans. I mean, they may not want to pay 8%, but they'll right. pay cash. They can pay or cash. Exactly. They can afford it. Exactly. But first-time Let home buyers' dreams are being dashed here, and that's the, that's the real challenge. And, I and he's absolutely right. You know, right now anyways, and don't worry, guys, things change. This isn't going to last forever. But right now, for sure, the dreams of first time home buyers absolutely being crushed, which is one of the reasons why I got to make this home buyer course. I'm like, I got to give back to the community that's helped me so much. But do me a favor, comment below. Let me know if you think they overcorrected during COVID. I mean, we could, I think in my opinion, you guys, we can safely assume that the low interest rates for that long, it messed us up. It, it was a total failure. It was a total disaster. Uh, and how much fraud do you guys think existed as a result of just, just the money printing? I think that there was a tremendous amount of fraud. Now, let me show you guys what the market is pricing in as far as interest rates, pretty much writing off completely November. So only a 7% chance of an interest rate hike in November. Remember guys, this is CME Fed Watch. You guys could take a look at this as well. Now, December is picking up a little steam, okay? Little steam, they're pricing in about... 34, so 34% likelihood of an additional rate increase in December. Now, you guys know I like looking at the middle of 2024 because we need to break through next year's buying seasonality. Now, when we look at July, we have an increase now of a likelihood of sustaining high interest rates. That goes to, let me do it in my head, 27%. So we're now at 20% likelihood to have elevated rates uh, in July. But we're at, let me see here, about 64 5% chance that we'll be at elevated rates or a quarter basis point lower. But either way, what I'm saying to you guys by looking at all of this information is this is the trajectory we want. We want to stay higher for longer. And what we don't want to happen, obviously, I think we're all starting to get this by now. We don't want the wrong black swan event to happen. If the wrong black swan event happens, the Fed will have no choice depending on what it is, right? But what we saw this year, they may have no choice but to bail them out. And by doing so, if they're going to bail out a portion of the economy, that's going to throw more money in the economy. That's going to increase the inflation more than likely, right? Like it did this year. That's what happened this year. And we're going to have to do some of what we're doing right now all over again. But honestly, guys, even if that happens, I I'm still more optimistic than after the bank run uh, bailout this year, because the buyers are being crushed. Who, who's buying houses right now? The only people that are buying houses right now are those well-qualified, well-positioned buyer. So when the market changes, guess who's going to have a better chance of getting the home of my dreams? I am because I'm still being patient. And also I haven't found the home that I'm looking for. I know what I want. I look for it every single day and I just can't find it. So 
Anyways, guys, we're going to go into our second video right now. Let me put my timestamp up on my second video. Okay, this is an interesting video. This is going to be from... Who is this? Oh, this is the uh, Mortgage Bank. Okay, Mortgage Bankers Association CEO. So we're going to listen to the Mortgage Bankers Association CEO, and he's going to go into the mortgage-backed security market, and and we'll look at the mortgage-backed security market after this because I think we would really need to see is the reverse repo market run out of money, and then we start going to need to see the mortgage-backed security holdings from the Fed start to go off of their balance sheet. So I'll go over that after this video, but this is a really good video. Hope you guys enjoy and let me know the audio is okay. Thank you, Johnny. I see your comments. Bob Brooksmith, Mortgage Bankers Association CEO. Bob, it, it's good to have you on. I, perhaps not surprising that we've seen mortgage rates move higher given what we've seen in the treasury market. I mean, is 8% really something that could be on the horizon? Well, unfortunately, Morgan, it already is reality for a lot of lenders who are quoting rates today because the numbers that we put out are last week's numbers and the market has continued to deteriorate. We got a little reprieve today, but we really need the 10-year treasury to come down. And more importantly, perhaps, the spread between the 10-year and the 30-year fixed rate mortgage mm. is at levels about 125 basis points higher than usual. And we really need some action for that to come in. And a couple of things I have in mind would be the Fed being clear that they're done with rate increases because we think that volatility in interest rates has increased that spread, and also for them to make clear that they're not going to sell mortgage-backed securities off their balance sheets. But we know they are, right? I mean, they, well, they, they're quanti they're, it's quantitative tightening. So I guess, I guess how realistic is it to think that um, even if Treasury yields come down, that you see some of these other pressures? And I know banks have been rethinking their investment portfolios and maybe selling out of MBS, too. How much how much how realistic is it to think that those forces are actually going to ebb? Well, when I when I talk about the Fed's holdings of MBS, of course, they are letting them amortize and prepay. But those are at very low levels. There's I still think some of the increase in the spread between the Treasury and the mortgages is a fear that the Fed would actually sell in the open market existing MBS. So if they were to make clear that that's not on the horizon, I think that that would help. And the bank demand will, I think, come back. Uh, we've seen some increase in supply with some of the failed banks, uh, MBS being on the market, but I think that's mostly been resolved now. Okay. Um, it, it's, it does feel like this perfect storm. I've heard the word used unprecedented because you have mortgage rates at these multi-decade highs. Um, you have housing inventory at these historical lows. Uh, and and then on top of it, you've got home prices that still seem to be moving higher. What is going to actually break this dynamic to create a more affordable housing market? Well, as rates get back to a more normal level, it will help both with supply and demand. And that may sound not very logical, but as you know, a lot of the reason for the shortage of inventory is that people have 3% mortgage rates and they're not willing to sell their house and take on a seven and a half or eight percent mortgage rate. But as rates come back into line, more transactions will get unstuck. The inventory will increase and then you can you can see this market moving again. We are seeing we've got a 44 year low in mortgage delinquencies. So people who have mortgages are paying them. And with unemployment at levels as low as they are, there are plenty of people who can afford the new mortgage rates. They may not like them, and they may refinance when things come down. But there is there is the demand, and supply is a problem. And I, I just got to ask, because we just showed it on the screen, you think rates are actually going to come down from here? Oh, absolutely. I think that the um, when the Fed what? Uh, finishes, we think they are finished. But when they make clear they're finished, we think that's a very positive signal to the market. And uh, the spreads, as I said, are at historic highs, and we think they'll come in. But it would be really great for the Fed to make that clear. It would be really great for the Fed to we'll make that clear, but they haven't create the world. They made clear the opposite, actually. And remember, guys, they still haven't even sold mortgage-backed securities. They're trying to let them fall off their balance sheet, but no one wants to refinance or purchase right now. So... I mean, they haven't even sold that. So guys, do me a favor. If you can comment below, let me know what impacts you think that the government selling mortgage-backed securities will have on the housing market. Now, obviously, more than likely, the rates will go up, mortgage rates will go up. But do you guys also think that that will also lead to additional credit tightening? I mean, if the government's not there to subsidize mortgages, 
that to me would indicate that credit tightening is going to happen on top of potentially interest rates going higher. And again, you guys, let me show you where we're at. And if you can comment below, let me know what you think, but take a look at the holdings for mortgage backed securities. Now, okay. <clears throat> for the past three weeks, it's been the same. Okay. So something funny is going on here. There's no way there's absolutely zero probability, zero probability that the mortgage backed security holdings stayed exactly the same for three weeks straight. Even if they didn't buy anymore, it's not going to stay the same because there's people refinancing and purchasing houses. So there's properties and mortgage backed securities rolling off their books. However, the really surprising thing here is you can't see that. Do y'all see what I'm saying? So for three weeks straight, it stayed exactly the same, but nevertheless, it has been trending downward, but nowhere near the trajectory of what the Federal Reserve wants to do. So understand that. Okay. So again, what I'm saying is, is first we need this to go away. This is the reverse repo market right now. It has 1.1 trillion, 1.1 trillion. Once this goes away, I think that I honestly believe that this will be next. And honestly, I also think that it's possible that the Federal Reserve or the government loses money by selling mortgage-backed securities. If the mortgage-backed securities that they have are the super low interest rate mortgage-backed securities, like two, three, four percent, they're going to lose money on this. This is a very bad situation for the Federal Reserve, except for the fact that they could just print money. So who the hell cares? Just delete all this money and just print some more down the road, right? But let us rebalance first. I'm just saying, you guys, oh my, oh my God, they print out, they print so much money. Anyways, we're going to listen to our next video right now. Let me throw up a time stampers if I can. So this next video, we're going to listen to the chief economist from City. Okay, so from City, chief economist is going to talk about basically rates. Okay, interest rates, inflation, inflation's still bad. Interest rates may go up because inflation's still bad. And also, guys, comment below. Do you all know where inflation's the worst? Where's inflation the stickiest? Is it bacon? Is it eggs? Where's the inflation the stickiest? Shelter, the housing market. Something needs to be done. Here's our next video. Joining us this morning, City Global Chief Economist Nathan Sheets is with us. Nathan, it's good to have you. We've had a day or so to slice and dice CPI, a lot of discussion about shelter away from home and so forth. Uh, what, how does it feed the, the Fed, I guess, communication over the next few weeks? Yeah, I think bottom line on this CPI report is that it was a reminder to Jay Powell and his colleagues that, yes, they made some uh, progress on inflation, but that road back to 2% is going to be long and challenging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, they still have some work to do. And uh, as a result of that, I think now the Fed is going to be kind of shifting its discussion from you know, how high do we need to be and where's the terminal rate, to how long uh, we're going to keep the, the rate above 5%. And I think ultimately it's going to be a while. We ought to get used to 5% uh, plus short-term interest rates. Are you, are you not of the school of thought that shelter at least or owner's equivalent rent will follow sort of the more recent data out of Zillow and new rents and so forth? In other words, the notion that shelter will eventually come to play uh, in the next few months? Yes, ab absolutely. I would, I would characterize the readings we got on shelter and owner's equivalent of rent as somewhat anomalous relative to uh, you know, what I was expecting and what we're seeing more broadly. But even so, uh, I think that there are going to be other surprises. And specifically, I think uh, that this report signaled that that non-shelter services component of inflation is still moving forward at a pretty rapid pace. And non-shelter <laughs> services, uh, notably, is a larger share of core PCE that the Fed watches even more uh, closely. And I think ultimately for the Fed to really make progress and get traction uh, on the shelter and uh, non-shelter inflation, it's gonna require uh, a loosening of the labor market. And that kind of brings in this discussion of recession risks. So is the point, Nathan, that we can't get both? Market can't get, can't get have its cake and eat it too. We can't get a soft landing with a decline in inflation all the way down to 2%, that doesn't happen? Um, 
it, if, if something like that happens, it would be unique relative to the past 60 years of U.S. economic history. And this is something that we've looked at very uh, carefully. Uh, over the last 60 years, we identified five similar episodes of rapid wage growth and high inflation. And the end game of all five of those episodes was a marked rise in the unemployment rate and, uh, and a recession. So I don't want to say it's absolutely <laughs> impossible, but it would be historically unprecedented and it would require us to answer the thorny question of, is this time really different? Nathan, how about employment? Uh, we're looking at, we're beginning to look at some 2024 forecasts. I've seen some, uh, some data that suggests maybe we trough in the 50K per month range. Others are saying we average maybe 100K for the last three quarters of the year. Where are you? Do we ever get negative on, on NFP? In a recession scenario where the unemployment rate is, is rising meaningfully, uh, then I think we are likely to see some negative numbers. And a recession at some point in 2024 uh, remains my base case. So let me say, yes, I'm not going to be surprised. And it's going to be painful. It's going to be challenging. But I'm not going to be surprised if we see uh, some negative uh, monthly prints on NFB. Uh, but, you know, as I say that, it will also take a discrete slowing of the economy uh, relative to where we are right now. And uh, the dynamics on how we get from this relatively resilient economy into that slower economy where, uh, you know, you're seeing negative uh, payroll prints. I think that's the big question. All right, guys. So last week we had some and the week before, actually, we had some stuff come over that showed that we're actually in worse shape. <laughs> we knew that, but we're actually in worse shape than the market realized as far as inflation. CPI came in hot. I mean, literally everything came in hot. Job numbers came in hot. I understand that the job numbers are absolute trash. Most of it is all part time. But nevertheless, that's what they're looking at to decide whether or not they should continue their interest rate hikes. So um, do me a favor, guys. Let me know what you think. OK, do you think that the Federal Reserve is going to hike rates at, you know, one more at least one more time this year? They got two more meetings, November and December. Do you guys think they're going to do it? Personally, I don't care. I don't care if they do it or not, because in my opinion, we're at a, you know, a level of tightening right now that's good and it's working. So personally, I don't care about a quarter base point. OK, I care about no more money printing and let's keep that 10 year elevated. That's what I care about. 25 basis points, honestly, guys, not going to make a huge difference. But nevertheless, look at what the market is thinking as far as inflation. This is what the Federal Reserve is keeping their eye on drastically when it comes to the expectations of inflation. Remember, they don't want the expectations of inflation to be ungrounded. If that happens, it can create very bad things, a panic. So they're looking at this five-year break-even inflation rate. And again, remember, We've been talking about this, this updates every single day. This needs to literally needs to be under two. Okay. It needs to be under two right now. It's at 2.26 and look at the trajectory. Okay. So we started making trajectory downward, but the market's always got things wrong. So when all of the jobs numbers and the CPI and all this stuff came out, look at the trajectory. The market went from 2.14, looks like 2.14 all the way up to 2.26. And I think in about a week. So this is skyrocketing back up because the market's starting to be aware, y'all, that Jerome Powell's not messing around. And when Jerome Powell says the market has yet to feel the full effects of the interest rate hikes and the quantitative tightening, he's right. And I believe the market's starting to feel that right now. And that's, I believe, why we see so many people start to change their narratives that were bullish. And one of the things that I'm seeing right now in front of, remember, in front of a recession, in front of unhinged unemployment is this. Look at U.S. corporate bankruptcies accelerate in the third quarter as 2023 rivals 2020 as the worst year in more than a decade. This is where I think the unemployment is going to come from right here. Corporate bankruptcies, because, again, remember, on top of them losing money, they got to refinance an un, like, unimaginable, unimaginable amount of debt. They have to. They have no option. It's either they refinance or they give the keys back. So refinance or give keys back. You guys take a look at the stats. The stats are insane. Let me scroll down here to, okay, take a look at this. This is the stats right here. This is, um, the blue represents year to date through September. Okay. 
So right now we have five and oh my gosh, Rite Aid. Holy smokes. Rite Aid. I think this was last night. Just filed for bankruptcy. Y'all, Rite Aid was a childhood store. I have fond memories of Rite Aid. I can't believe they just filed bankruptcy. So Rite Aid is out of here. But anyway, so add, add the five, 517, right? But right now we're sitting at 516 companies. Now I want to point out 2020, we had 518. So we have almost the same amount of bankruptcies as when we were locked down. So there's so much pressure, crosswinds, undertoes, currents, that it's almost the same as lockdowns. But why aren't, you know, but then ask, why isn't things falling apart then? It's because there's so much money still in the system. We see it in the reverse repo market. We see it in excess savings. There's still so much money. But take a look at this. If we don't look at the lockdowns, the last time we had this much bankruptcy was 2010, which was right outside of the great financial crisis. Look at that. 2010, you guys, 657. So the, my point is the trajectory right now of bankruptcies in the corporate world is skyrocketing. I mean, it's really concerning. And we're not even talking about like commercial real estate meltdown. We're just talking about corporations and why are they suffering right now, you guys? The 10 year, predominantly the 10 year. The 10 year is wiping out so many people and their ability to make money. Remember that. So the 10 year hurts the economy, it hurts businesses. We're going to go into our last video right now, you guys. Uh, basically, the last video is going to go into the sediment. Um, being absolute garbage right now. And honestly, what's so surprising to me is how powerful emotion is. Emotion is just, it, it, it's just so powerful. That's why the Fed looks at expectations of inflation. Why are emotions so powerful? It, it's, why do we even use that to measure? Anyways, guys, here's our last. Good morning, Carl and Sarah. And do look at interest rates. They're moving up a bit. Stocks moving down a bit. Maybe here's the reason why. University of Michigan sentiment at 63, a disappointment. Weakest level since May. Now, these are preliminary. They can't change. 66.7 on current conditions. Much weaker than 70.3. Expectations. 60.7, we were expecting a number closer to 66, also the weakest number since May. And one-year inflation went from a 3.2, lowest since March of 21, to the highest since May of this year at 3.8%. And five to 10-year inflation moved from 2.8, the lowest since SEP of 22, up to 3%. And even though we've had several 3% to find a higher number at 3.1%, Guess what month? You have to go to May. So May is wild, and these are wild <laughs> numbers. Higher inflation, weaker confidence, and this could be the stencil to pay attention to as prices remain sticky and growth becomes more questionable, at least based on some of these qualitative surveys. Sarah, back to you. <laughs> Now, obviously he's hyper bullish, but man, I love that guy's energy. Honestly, I try to bring that same energy in the mornings. I don't know how he does it. I love that guy's energy. But what he's saying is absolute trash LA. So um, I'm going to go into the Q and A's, but before I do that, let me show you guys what I've been up to as far as my home buying course. Again, I'm going to try to have that out this evening as far as the first module, but I want to show you where I've been doing. Okay. Now this is just beta and this is just a draft. I'm going to have a better thumbnail. This is I just, I had to have thumbnails, but this is where I'm at so far. Uh, now I have the next two chapters done. So I have the purchasing power module completed already. I filmed, I think six lessons before I started this live, but let me show you guys kind of what this looks like. So you would come here, you would start the lesson. Um, and for example, like here's the credit lesson. And, and you guys, this is for free. This is, I need to give this, I need this for myself. I need to give back to you guys. But like, for example, you know, here's the summary, you know, what makes up credit score, credit lesson 101. Then I give you guys, you know, quick bullet points of the lesson summary, things that I want you to remember. And then take a look at this. Every chapter, uh, I'm sorry, every lesson has a quiz. So these quizzes are designed for you guys to answer questions that I want you to remember forever, right? So this is pretty cool. Again, I probably will have this live tonight, at least the first module. Here's the, you know, here's the next lesson. This is about income. So I tell you guys about income is a summary. Uh, here's the lesson, you know, quick bullet points and then a quiz. The quizzes are so important. And honestly, guys, this is taking um, a little bit longer than I thought because <laughs> I had to learn the platform. I forgot I, I had to learn the entire platform and I didn't know how to do that. Uh, so let me go into some uh, Q and days right now. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thanks for all the great uh, info. Waiting to buy some houses next year. I own my house with no mortgage and no debt. People pay off your debt. And, and Mike, I'm so glad you said that um, because 
I worry that people are so focused on the payment that they're losing sight of the mechanics of purchasing, the internals of purchasing. Did I get a great deal? Did I not get a great deal? Because if they're only looking at payment, they're not looking at price. And price, my friends, is more important. But regardless, those mortgages, those amortization schedules, absolutely horrible. So props to you, Mike. Good job, my friend. You don't want to have mortgage debt. And I really appreciate that don that, do that donation, man. I appreciate that. Also, I see we have a new member. What's up, uh, Night Cree? Welcome, man. I'm finally going to be able to give back to the members. It's 99 cents to join. You guys don't have to join. But if you want to head start on that home buyers course, you can, but you don't have to. Here's a comment right here. I've had loans. I made the extra uh, principal payment of $20,000 and I called the bank and had them reamortize my loan. Um, so I had the same, you can make multiple down payments and change your, your monthly payment. So here's the thing, you guys, um, when you pay your loan off, like early, when you put extra money towards principal, they don't change the payment. So that was comics debate. He's like, if you put a down payment, your payment will be lower because you're putting more money down. But if you're doing, if you're paying the amortization schedule down, understand that your payment does not go down with it. Okay. So understand that. But being that you have the higher payment, understand as well that more money will go towards paying down your principal. So long as you pay down your amortization schedule. Thank you, Neil. Appreciate that comment. Here's a comment from sacred. I think I'm probably going to sit out this market even if it crashes, just because I want to build a nest egg before I make a big purchase. And he has the right mentality. The whole mentality where people are rushing out, looking just for a payment they can afford is the wrong mindset to have. You want to enter home ownership like a champion, because especially right now, if, if maybe it was 2018, just go buy a house. It's cheaper to buy a house than it is to rent. It's a slam dunk. And I'll help you. I'll be your realtor, right? But fast forward to today, it's real bad. It's real bad. So I think he has the right mindset. The less obsessed you are sacred and the more you're worrying about yourself and rising above this toxicity, the better you're going to do. Listen to what I'm saying. I love that mindset. You're not rushing. You're playing smart. Good man. Uh, here's another comment. Neil Warren, exactly this. Paying principal and keeping the same payment when you can shrink it, the payment is senseless. So the reason I, <clears throat> this is not really a knock to you, but the reason I pulled this comment up is because I want to let you guys know this is absolutely the wrong attitude to have. And the reason I'm saying that I'll explain, and I've seen this happen for two decades. And I always like to bring into like into this conversation, used car salesmen. Used car salesmen will always sell you on a payment. Okay. Now, when I'm talking about amortization schedule, I'm talking about avoiding interest. And I'm talking about the fact that if you, as an example earlier, I put $17,000 down and I save 125,000. Does that lower my payment? No, but guess what? I purchased my house with an easy ability to afford will I live so I can handle an extra mortgage payment if I want. Because again, remember, I'm well qualified and I'm not extended. So don't have that mindset. You want to pay your debt off early, even if it doesn't drop your payment. Everyone's just fixated on that payment. You have to look at the fees, the cost, the true cost of ownership. Please, you guys, don't just look at the payment. All right. Don't just look at the payment. Look at how much it cost you. BRN. Thank you for commenting, BRN. Who thinks the Fed actually wants the housing market to crash or uh, at least a significant correction? He thinks that they do, but they won't say that out loud. The fact that Powell said we need a bit of a reset. So a lot of people, especially bulls, does not think the Federal Reserve wants the housing market to crash. But here's the thing, you guys. If the Federal Reserve has a 2%, okay, good luck on that, has a 2 thank God that they have this, by the way. I'm really happy about that, actually. They have a 2% inflation goal. The thing is, guys, is we know that the housing market accounts for, what, 40% of uh, CPI and, what, 19% of total GDP? Let me ask you this question. How will the Fed get to their 2% target rate without prices going down in the housing market. How can they do that without the prices going down? Because remember, the prices of houses is in the inflation numbers, depending on the metrics, of course. I don't think there's another way to do it. So will they say it? No, they won't say that. We know that because Ben Bernanke, which just happened, the great financial crisis, he, up until 2008, he was saying no market collapse. 2008, he's still saying that. Dooster, I love you. I hope everything is well. Uh, been with us from the very beginning. <clears throat> Here's what Dooster has to say. 
they want people to spend, won't raise rates, data will show great spending, then boom, rates will increase in 2024. Uh, when most families will be further in debt with holiday spending. So he's, I think what he's saying is they don't want to raise rates because of holiday spending. Um, and they're going to raise it after the holiday season, right? So Duster, I think, thinks that they're going to raise interest rates, not again this year, but maybe in the start of next year as a result of the spending. <clears throat> is that right, Duster? Let me know. <clears throat> Sorry, guys, I got a few more here. Okay, so this is from OB. There was a ton of fraud. Oh my gosh, everyone. I mean, there, there's just so much fraud. I worked in HR for a big payroll company and the claims made for people to get unemployment money were completely fraudulent. There was incentive for people to stay at home. Remember guys, and, and again, society is so messed up. There were certain, especially young people. You guys, during COVID, there were people that were getting paid more money for being on unemployment than work. Did you hear me? I knew people that were making $2,000 more by being unemployed. There's so much fraud. <clears throat> There's so much fraud. Christian, we are already in a crash. No one will admit it till it's too hard to find it. And honestly, you guys, I think I agree with him. I think that the moment the Federal Reserve started doing quantitative tightening, the house market is starting to crash. I think it's already started. I think the only thing that we saw this season was a type of beast. And I'll admit it was a beast. It's a beast. But a type of dead cat balance. I think it's a sucker's rally. And honestly, I think that we're in a crash. Um, but my definition, remember, I haven't said like confirmed 100% we're in a crash, just that we are headed there because my definition is 15% from peak. We made it to 13%. So we almost hit it, but we didn't hit my definition of 15%. Johnny's right. Um, so a lot of people are concerned with the cost of the federal debt, but I would be more concerned with the cost of inflation uh, and the cost of like rioting and consumer defaults. I think consumer defaults would be bigger than the interest charge on federal debt. Johnny, I love you, man. I'm really looking forward to your channel. Hope you do that soon. Millennials are choosing to spend and renting instead of home ownership because they can't afford to own a home. Boomers will have to cut the prices to sell their home, especially if they have second homes, especially if they have you know, second homes. All right. Also, this is a good point from Nikki. Why don't big investors want to buy houses right now? They can cap more by buying T-bills. They can get over 5% in T-bills right now. Oh, man, I got some. Um... Oh, I got some new members. Thank you, James. Thank you for being a member. Um, boom, 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 boom. Okay, so let me just do one more. Okay, so this is from BRM. I just want a low principal. I can make bigger percentage down payments and pay it down faster. Exactly. I'm not a monthly payment. Let the interest let the interest pile up forever type of person. I don't like it. That's the point I was trying to make. Yes, BRM. Thank you, dude. That's the point I'm trying to make. Like, stop getting sold on that payment. Start understanding the fees and the charges and understand also if you refinance, if you got sucked into the whole just refinance later, understand you've just wasted all of your money. You've literally not paid down your principal and almost all of your money goes towards interest. And if you refinance, you just start that all over again. And your true interest rate is more like 150%, by the way. So anyways, guys, I really appreciate your comments. I think you have great comments. Remember, oh my God, Duster. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, remember for 12 months? How did that come up? Did you just get, I think Dooster just got an award or something. You've been a member for 12 months, Dooster. Thank you, brother. But remember, guys, uh, I'm going to have a video this evening uh, for Zillow. Zillow has a housing market update video. Watch that video. Some really crazy trends happening in the housing market. And then after that, if you're a member already on my channel, I am going to try to give you guys the link to start the first module of our home buying course. And other than that, guys, if you're out there investing in real estate, you already know I wish you luck. And obviously, I hope you win.